I'm Dwayne King, and the last time I saw many of you, you were on the screen about this big. <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciate you coming back again today to uh, uh, visit. Uh, yeah. uh, this uh, ch uh, Cherokee Bandolier bag was acquired by the Gilcrease Museum in 2011. And the bag itself is significant in that it shows uh, tr uh, tremendous, uh, great skill in executing the uh, floral designs and the beadwork. And it also shows a, a tr uh, transitional style between the more uh, common V flap uh, Cherokee bandoliers of, of the 1820s and 30s and what later became known as the prairie style. But this bag in particular is significant because of the letter that came with it. And the letter documents the gifting of this shot pouch, a pipe and a plug of tobacco on April the 20th, 1846, uh, by a respected Cherokee veteran of the Red Stick War named Dakwa, or the Quail, to an Army officer, uh, Second Lieutenant uh, K. Johnson Couts of the 1st Dragoons uh, stationed at Fort Gibson. And the letter was written by the then clerk of the Cherokee Senate, William Potter Ross. This letter uh, reveals the symbolic role that this bank uh, played in the political intrigue surrounding the post removal factionalism in the Cherokee Nation. But further research reveals a very fascinating story of ambivalence by the United States Army uh, and conflicting reports about the murders that led up to the Treaty of 1846 in which amnesty was granted to everyone who had participated in the post-removal Cherokee violence. On uh, July the, uh, 12, uh, 2010, this bandolier bay was appraised on the Antiques Roadshow in San Diego, California. And it was appraised by uh, Ted Trotta, uh, who uh, appraise it solely on the basis of its value as an object uh, without fully uh, recognizing the historical significance. The bag was in the possession of the 93-year-old great-granddaughter of uh, uh, Lieutenant K. Johnson Counts, and it had been in her family for four generations and after the uh, appraisal uh, she decided and the family decided it was time for uh, someone else to take care of it. So we were very fortunate to uh, to obtain uh, this bag and bring it back to uh, Oklahoma. Uh, but uh, I, I want to first talk about the bag itself. Uh, it has uh, indigo and brown straw cloth foundation. Uh, it has a, a floral design throughout uh, the, the back of the bag has a printed uh, calico and brown uh, straw cloth on the bag and the lobes of the bag on the front side have uh, this uh, rattlesnake uh, design uh, a symbol of power and white seed beads are sewn on with linen uh, thread on a silk foundation and these are uh, restored uh, as are the red tassels. There were only a few surviving red tassels, so most of what you see here was restored based on the, on the length and the material of uh, the originals. But the, the beadwork itself is about 98% intact. And uh, the, the main feature are, are these anthropomorphic uh, figures uh, on the base of the bay, uh, two females and a, and a male in the center with these sprouts uh, coming out at the shoulders. Uh, it also has a uh, opens with a slip, which is more of a Delaware pattern, or uh, or uh, uh, developed by the Delawares as opposed to the Cherokees. But there's no question Cherokees were using bags at this time in the 1840s. So I'll uh, show you an illustration uh, of that later. But this is the letter, the bag, and the plug of tobacco. Uh, this is a uh, a, sim uh, a bag from the same period. This one is in the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington. It's uh, at the Suitland facility in, in Maryland. 
it has a V-shaped flap, and on the inside of the flap, it's embroidered uh, to General Jackson from Sam Houston. And we believe this bag dates to about 1825. And it also has uh, red yarn tassels uh, at, the, at the bottom. In spite of the fact that bags like this were in common use during the second quarter of the 19th century, uh, perhaps no more than two dozen have survived down to the present. And of those, only about five have known histories. And um, uh, among those are the bag that belonged to Osceola, uh, which is now in the possession of the Florida Seminoles, uh, a bag uh, that belonged to Niamatla, uh, and now in a private collection, and uh, the bag that I showed you earlier uh, that was given to Andrew Jackson. So uh, fewer than, than five have uh, known histories. The others are simply uh, known by tribal affiliation and approximate date. The letter written by William Carter Ross and you may, uh, and I know you can't read it from there, but I, I do want to provide the contents of this. I had stayed at Tahlequah, Cherokee Nation, April the 20th, 1846. And it says, along with this note, I have the pleasure to send to you a beaded shot pouch, a pipe, and a piece of tobacco. They are a present from my friend, Dockwell, a venerable man who fought with General Andrew Jackson in the Creek War is a pensioner of the government on account of wounds then received and has in his possession a rifle gun which was ordered to be made for him by President Madison as a token of his regard for the heroism he displayed at the Battle of to Toho Pica, a horseshoe bend. The cause that induces the old warrior to make this present is the correct and manly views you have publicly expressed in regard to the recent disturbances and, the, and to the real character of the many desperate men who have fled from this country on account of their crimes, but who endeavor to solicit sympathy and protection of officers of the United States by holding themselves as refugees from political persecution. He is glad to find in you a friend to truth and justice and hopes that you will be assured of his regard for the same, of his love and desire for peace, of his feelings towards the whites and his earnest desire to see before he dies the people and government of the Cherokee Nation happy and prosperous. Hoping that the present may uh, prove acceptable, coming as it does from a brave, honest, and patriotic old man who is much respected by the Cherokees and whose life has been threatened by the banditti who know but to fear him. To fully appreciate this letter, it's necessary to analyze its contents. It's amazing how much information is contained in the letter, but without the, the context, it's virtually meaningless. In the second sentence, uh, Ross refers to Dockwa's military uh, war record. And this is easy to verify uh, by going back to the uh, pension applications uh, for uh, Cherokee warriors. And on August 16, 1837, prior to the removal at the Cherokee Agency in the East, two medical doctors associated with the removal, uh, J.W. Lyde and James Hunter, wrote this letter. And uh, it, in effect, says that uh, they certify from satisfactory evidence and careful examination, it appears that Dakwa, a Cherokee warrior of Captain Raincrow's company, in the Cherokee Regiment employed in the service of the United States in the late war while engaged in the line of uh, duty with the enemy at the Battle of the Horseshoe received a gunshot wound passing entirely through the left arm, fracturing the bone, and, uh, and which has two-thirds disabled him from uh, obtaining his subsistence. Six years later, in the Indian Territory, after removal, uh, another document was signed by a military surgeon. <coughs> and this also uh, recognizes that uh, Dakwa 
served un under Captain Rain Crow in the Creek War and was wounded on March 27, 1814 at the Battle <coughs> of the Horseshoe. And uh, he also describes the wound and says that the, the, his left humerus, uh, which was fractured, uh, uh, mended later, not at the time of the wound, but mended somewhat later and rendered him one half disabled. So as a result of this disability and the testimony given by the others who were present, including John Ross, who was an adjutant under, uh, uh, in the Cherokee Regiment under uh, Gideon Morgan, uh, testified also that uh, 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 to his military service. And he was given a military pension, which uh, according to this, um, amounted to four dollars per month commencing on March the 14th, 1814. So as a result of that, he was paid in a lump sum in 1843, fourteen hundred and fifty one dollars uh, as a pension for his disability dating back to the uh, Creek War. So at that <coughs> period of time, fourteen hundred fifty one dollars is a considerable amount of money, keeping in mind that uh, everyone who removed received about $58 for <coughs> a subsistence for one year. So if you could survive for one year on $58, this was more than 25 years of uh, disability pensions. The Creek War in 1813-14 involved more than uh, 300 uh, Cherokees who served with the East Tennessee Militia. And they trained at, at Moccasin Bend at Ross's Landing in January of uh, 1814. Uh, according to the, the war record, Dakwa was enlisted in the Cherokee Regiment from January 27th uh, until April 14th, 1814, so about two weeks after he was wounded, uh, he was discharged. And the, the battle, there were a series of battles fought between the, the Tennessee Militia and the regular army, the, the 39th uh, Infantry, was the only regular uh, regiment uh, in this invasion of the Creek country, about 3,000 members of the Tennessee militia and about 350 uh, Cherokees. And, uh, and the decisive battle was uh, the one that took place on March 27, 1814 at the Battle of the Horseshoe. And the, the Creeks had built a fort of the, uh, the, the largest town in this part of the Creek country was the, uh, on this uh, neck uh, uh, of this uh, in the river and they built a fortification around the narrow part, part of the neck and the Creek uh, forces were commanded by Manawa who was uh, half Scots and half Creek and uh, it was a very defensible uh, position. The, most of the Tennessee militia, the Middle Tennessee and West Tennessee militia, and the 39th uh, U.S. Infantry uh, came in from the north. The East Tennessee militia uh, uh, were sent to the other side of the horseshoe and Coffee's uh, under uh, John Coffee, and the Cherokees were in this area here right on the river. And their role was to keep the, the Creeks from escaping across the river. But the whale and two others decided that it was time to attack. So they swam the river, captured two creek canoes. Dockwell was wounded in this uh, uh, attempt and was ferried back across the river uh, in one of the canoes. And uh, they swam the river when it was at full stage. They were right in you know, this area down here. But by bringing those two canoes back, other Cherokees were able to cross the river, bring back more canoes, and soon virtually all of the Cherokees involved in the battle had crossed the river and were engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat uh, on the other side. What this did was it caused the Creeks to uh, move back from the barricade uh, to uh, fight the Cherokees and the East Tennessee militia that had crossed the river, leaving the barricade underdefended. Uh, Captain or, uh, Colonel Morgan rode uh, around the horse, horseshoe to take word to uh, Major 
uh, Lemuel Montgomery of the 39th Regiment to tell him that the battle had already begun. And as a result, uh, Andrew Jackson ordered a frontal assault. And uh, Montgomery climbed up on the barricade, encouraged his men to move forward, and was uh, shot and killed very early uh, in the battle, uh, standing on top of the barricade. And he's buried uh, uh, up beneath this uh, headstone. And Montgomery, Alabama is named after uh, this individual. Someone else who was wounded in the battle was Sam Houston, who was uh, ensign in the East Tennessee militia. Uh, just a few months earlier, he had been teaching school in this one-room schoolhouse at Maryville, Tennessee. And uh, Houston later became governor of Tennessee. And when he decided he didn't want to be governor anymore, he did what any sensible person would do. He left the office and went to live with the Cherokees. Horseshoe <laughs> uh, Bend today is a national military park. And in 1914, uh, on the 100th anniversary of the celebration of the park, uh, a rifle was displayed and it was inscribed to the, the whale. And uh, when the park opened in the 1950s, the family who owned the rifle donated it to the Alabama Department of History and Archives and it was turned over to the National Military Park. But it's one of the prized possessions in the park today. And it says, presented by J. Madison, President of the U.S. to Whale uh, in recognition of valor and heroism at the Battle of the Horseshoe. March 1814. It also says on the caption underneath the rifle uh, that the rifle was intended for presentation by President Mad Madison to the whale, uh, but two rifles were ultimately uh, built for whale, but it's unknown which, if any, he received. So uh, th there's some controversy as to whether or not this is the first or second rifle. And uh, it isn't, wasn't known when this caption was uh, written whether or not he received either rifle. I, I would contend that this is probably the first rifle, not the second one. The second one, according to the, the letter that came with the Mandalier Bay, clearly indicates that he had a rifle in his possession. And in 1843, about the time he was applying for, for a military pension, he also asked for restoration of the rifle, which he never received. And in that uh, plea, he cites the inscription, and it's virtually identical to the one that's on the rifle at Horseshoe Bend. And Lewis Ross, uh, who was living at the Cherokee Agency at the time, uh, the brother of John Ross, wrote a letter in, uh, in support of his claim saying, that he saw the rifle that was intended for the whale, and he can testify that the whale never received it, that uh, the, the agent or Major Walker uh, directed uh, it be given to someone else. So it ended up uh, in a family in Gadsden, uh, Alabama, uh, named Mitchell, and it's not sure whether they received it at the time or acquired it sometime in the 19th century. But uh, at any rate, this is the first rifle, uh, not the second one. And, uh, and uh, Lewis Ross said, along with the rifle, a medal with the likeness of the president, uh, James Madison, was also uh, included. So they asked for a restoration of the medal as well. And it was a peace medal, uh, similar uh, to this one uh, in the Gilcrease collection. The second rifle that was made for the whale was uh, made in Washington, D.C., and it, it contained a likeness of Andrew Jackson, and another presidential medal was given. But the inscri inscription this time says, presented by the President of the United States without identifying which one. But it was probably James Tyler, and uh, probably a Tyler peace medal, uh, similar to this one, was given. Uh, with the rifle, and we're not sure where those are today, but hopefully they're still around someplace. William Potter Ross uh, was an 1842 uh, graduate of Princeton, 
and he came back to the Cherokee Nation uh, after graduation, going by way of Chattanooga by his birthplace at the foot of Lookout Mountain, and then uh, ended up in, in Tahlequah. And in June of 1843, uh, he was at the, the uh, Grand Council, also in 1843, uh, later in the year he married Mary Jane Ross. But this is the, the, the council of 21 tribes at Tahlequah, painted by John McStanley. And uh, this is an important painting for several reasons. And this is, not I apologize, this isn't a very clear image, but several of the people in here are recognizable. John Ross uh, uh, and, and a few other uh, people. But the, the reason I wanted to put this in here was for two reasons. One is at this council meeting, Assistant uh, Chief George Lowry spoke at length uh, about the Cherokee wampum. And I believe this is the same wampum that was at the town of Chota on July the 8th, uh, 1776, when the attacks on the settlements in Upper East Tennessee were planned uh, on, at Watauga, uh, Carter's Valley, and the Nolichucky. And uh, Lowry interpreted the wampum at this council meeting, which William Potter Ross attended. And I believe it's the same wampum that was handed down in the family of John Ross and Bob Ross in 1905, loaned to the Kutuwa Society. But uh, under this council shed in June of uh, 1843, this council of 21 tribes uh, were brought together to, to talk about peace and tranquility among the tribes that had uh, suddenly found themselves in the Indian Territory. And the, the Plains tribes are seated closer uh, to the left of this photograph, and uh, individuals wearing a uh, typical Cherokee dress are in the center and on the right side of the painting. But I wanted to call this to your attention because of these two bandolier bags that are depicted in this painting, which is now in the National Portrait Gallery, Gallery in Washington, D.C. This is a bandolier bag very similar to the one owned by Dakwa with the top slit, uh, red tassels uh, around the fringes, and beadwork uh, along the bandolier and on the uh, forward design of the pouch. This bandolier bag here in the lower center is, is a V-shaped flat bag, very similar to the one presented to Andrew Jackson by Sam Houston. And, and this is the only depiction that I know of that shows both styles of bag in the same illustration, so we know that they were used at the same time. And this is very close to the date of, of the presentation of the Dakwa bag to Lieutenant Counts. And that these are the, uh, the two bags that have survived to the present. There's also another Cherokee bandolier bag at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. Now, at the time of removal, or shortly after removal, there were three factions in the Cherokee Nation. The old settlers, those individuals who had voluntarily immigrated to the West prior to the signing of the Treaty of New Echota in December of 1835. And for the most part, these were individuals or families that had immigrated to Arkansas. And in 1828, they ceded this tract of land in exchange for land that was then occupied by Osage Indians in eastern, what's now eastern Oklahoma. And Sequoia was one of the members of the delegation in 1828 that, that ceded the Arkansas uh, territory. The other uh, two factions were those who supported the treaty and who uh, voluntarily removed between the time it was ratified in May of 1836 and the time that the, the two years elapsed for voluntary removal in 1838. And there were about 2,000 uh, people who moved to the Indian Territory during that time period. And then the, the largest group were the people who were opposed to removal uh, who uh, were followers of Principal Chief John Ross, and there were, there were about 14,000 individuals who were forcefully removed between June and December of 1838. And most of those came overland. This is the only wagon that has survived uh, from the, the forced removal period. But 
the, the people who were forced to remove blame the people who signed the treaty on um, all of the losses in the East and the hardships that the Cherokees endured on, uh, on the uh, route west. And these are uh, statues of uh, White Path and Fly Smith who died and were buried at Hopkinsville, Kentucky. But there were many people who uh, died on the route or in, in uh, concentration camps before the immigration started or after they uh, arrived in Indian Territory from the hardships uh, of the removal. So in early June of 1839, uh, four miles north of Talapana, uh, a number of uh, men gathered and drew straws to determine who the assassins would be of uh, the three principal signers of the treaty. And it was Major Ridge himself in 1830, in 1829, who introduced legislation making it a capital offense for any Cherokee to seek land uh, to the United States without first having the permission of the National Council and National Committee. But it's the United States government unable to make a treaty <laughs> with the duly authorized representatives of the Cherokee Nation who signed the treaty uh, with the minority faction. But on June 22, 1839, Major Ridge, John Ridge, and Elias Boudinot were all killed uh, the same morning. Uh, John Ridge had his home at Honey Springs. Elias Boudinot had his home uh, at Park Hill near Tahlequah. And Major Ridge, while riding to his daughter's house just across the Arkansas line. And according to Jack Baker, this is where that took place. And, and Jack got his information from T.L. Ballinger and Mary Butcher, so uh, we, we I feel very confident that this is the location right in here mm -hmm. where Major Ridge uh, uh, was killed on June 22nd. This is on Little Branch, just uh, east of Stillwell, uh, across the Arkansas state line. But there were three general meetings uh, within the uh, first year after removal to unify the Cherokee Nation and bring the three groups together. And the date on the seal of the Cherokee Nation, September 6th, uh, represents uh, uh, an early attempt at forging an alliance between the three uh, groups in the Indian Territory. In 1843, the Cherokee National Council uh, passed a, a, a resolution uh, which was unfavorable to the old settlers. Uh, many of the recent arrivals felt that those who had arrived first had advantages over the people who came later. And one of those advantages was claiming prime land and claiming salt deposits. And Salina, Oklahoma was one of those locations where uh, there was a major salt deposit. And in the days prior to refrigeration, everyone needed salt for the preservation of meat. Uh, so in 1843, the, the National Council nationalized all the salt deposits in the Cherokee Nation, with the exception of the uh, saline that uh, Sequoia owned in Sequoia County, and I think that was in recognition of his service uh, to the Cherokee Nation by creating the writing system. But during this time, uh, th th there was continued uh, factionalism uh, within the nation, and I'm not going to go into all the details, but uh, Jesse Bushyhead, shown here, was a Supreme Court Justice, Chief of the Supreme Court and presided over a very early uh, murder trial, uh, which was uh, uh, recorded by John Howard Payne. And that was the trial of Archilla Ar Ar uh, Smith, and he was hanged uh, after his appeals to Principal Chief John Ross were turned down because they weren't signed by either the, the Chief Justice or any of the uh, members of the jury. And David Dan uh, was killed in 1863 by the uh, Penn Indians uh, during the Civil War, a uh, uh, continuation of the post uh, uh factionalism. But I want to talk about two specific instances uh, which uh, relate to the, the Vandalier Bay. On November 2nd, 1845, uh, intruders uh, came to the home of uh, Return Jonathan Mix near Tahlequah and uh, stuck guns to the window, windows demanded uh, entry and Miggs escape by running out the back door. They shot at him, missed, and he uh, was not injured, 
but his house was burned to the ground, and the only things left standing were the brick uh, walls. Uh, the next morning, the bodies of two Cherokees, uh, also apparently victims of this group that came to Mick's house, uh, were found uh, murdered and mutilated. And, uh, and a, a committee who later investigated this concluded that the people involved in this uh, attack were Thomas Starr, Ellis Starr, Washington Starr, Sewell, or Ellis Ryder, and Ellis West. And uh, this occurred uh, near Park Hill. A week later, less than a week later, uh, on November the 9th, a group of armed men arrived at the house of James Starr near present-day Stillwell. And there were probably 16 individuals in this group. And uh, these, according to one of the depositions, were members of the Ross Party. But the leader of the group was the person who owned the Vandalier Bay, Dakwa. But also in the group were uh, two other people named with the same name who we believe were his sons, Toleski and Lewis. Uh, but uh, John Tato, uh, John Downing, Bill Sourjohn, Otterlifter, a youth named Benj, Big Stan, and Lewis Nelms uh, were also in the group. James Starr's home place uh, is on Highway 100 between Stillwell and the Arkansas State Line. And at the time in 1840, and, and this is obviously a modern house, probably built in the second half of the 20th century, uh, it's rumored that there is a log structure underneath this that may be uh, part of the original uh, Star home place. But uh, at, at the time, uh, according to his wife, his mother-in-law, and his daughter, who all gave depositions to James McKissick, uh, who was the Cherokee agent, uh, this group rode up in the morning. His wife believed that they were Light Horse or uh, Cherokee National Police. And James Starr told his family not to worry, not to say anything to them, let them search the house, and, and they would leave. But when they rode up, and uh, according to the depositions, uh, uh, James Starr was in the uh, piazza, in the plaza uh, of the house, uh, at the washing place, washing his uh, hands and face, and his son, Buck Starr, was pouring water from the gourd over his hands. and. Um, uh, one of the individuals, Teleski Dakwa, dismounted and fired immediately, uh, shot him. And Lewis Nell, according to another deposition, fired a second shot. And James Starr encouraged his 14-year-old son, uh, Buck Starr, to run and make his escape. And as he ran, he was shot uh, twice in the arm and once in the hip. And he uh, languished for about six weeks before he died. Uh, we believe that uh, this uh, great marker in the Oak Grove Cemetery is the marker of James Starr. And this is based on a uh, family oral tradition that was uh, handed down uh, to, uh, by Lucinda Starr, his daughter, and then uh, to her granddaughter, uh, and then to David Hampton in the 1970s. So we're very confident that this is the location of his grave, and uh, he would have been buried there uh, uh, sometime after November 9, 1845. Now, uh, according to the depositions, uh, there were three younger uh, boys in the house, uh, preteens, uh, who were James Starr's sons, and uh, they were protected by the women in the house who uh, put themselves between the, the boys and the, and the armed group and prevented them from being shot. Mary Starr, who was 16 years old at the time, uh, caught her horse and tried to make her escape on horseback, but she said that they beat the horse with their guns and fretted the horse so much that she was forced to dismount. Had she been able to escape, she probably would have ridden to the home of Sewell Ryder, uh, not far from here, to warn him of this uh, group in the area. But uh, the, the group did go to Sewell Ryder's home next, and uh, he and his mother were in the kitchen, which was a separate building from the living quarters. And John Tato, a member of the group, led Sewell Ryder out of the kitchen into the yard 
shoved him, shot him. Uh, several other people shot as well. And then uh, John Tato grabbed a pistol from another uh, man and shot again, so the, he was wounded seven times. Never fell, uh, but uh, attempted to run between the kitchen and the house and was stayed up by, with a knife by Big Stan twice before he fell and died within about an hour uh, afterwards. Uh, we, we assume that a Sewell Rider was buried on his property. There's no grave marker. Uh, but the family tradition says that because all the men in the family had fled to Arkansas, his mother uh, uh, buried him by herself. Uh, the one thing I was looking for uh, when we went to this cemetery was a marker for Buck uh, Starr, uh, who died about six weeks later. And I don't know if you can see it, but there's another stone made from the same material. Uh, it's rounded, slightly smaller, and it's tipped over uh, just a few feet away from the tombstone of James Starr. So this is possibly the great marker of Buck Starr. But as a result of this, and there were probably about a hundred individuals who uh, feared for their lives because they were either associated with the uh, treaty party or neighbors or friends of uh, James Starr, who fled to Arkansas to get uh, across the, to get out of the Cherokee Nation. Uh, General Matthew Arbuckle was in command of Fort Smith, the 7th Military District, <coughs> and was uh, 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 sent a, a demanding letter to the Cherokee Nation, demanding that the Light Horse be disbanded, that the murderers be arrested and tried, uh, and that peace be restored within the Cherokee Nation. Uh, George Lowry, uh, who was acting principal chief at the time while John Ross was in Washington, uh, wrote back that, first of all, the Light Horse didn't exist, or had uh, what, what, that, that the people who committed uh, this attack were not members of the Light Horse, that the, that the authorization for the Light Horse had only been passed on November the 8th, and this was in response uh, to the attack um, of uh, Return Jonathan Meek's home, and that uh, the captain and lieutenant uh, had not yet been appointed, and the Light Horse uh, hastily assembled after these events did show up uh, in the Going Snake District on November the 12th, uh, several days after the murders uh, took place. But uh, George Lowry uh, attempted to distance the Cherokee Nation from the, the, the uh, violence and uh, indicated that the people involved had no affiliation with the tribal government. Um, Arbuckle responded by sending a company of first dragoons from Fort Gibson to Evansville, Arkansas. And a member of that detachment was Lieutenant K. Johnson Counts, the recipient of the Bandelier Bank. If there was a public building in Vineyard, uh, uh, now Evansville, Arkansas, at the time, it was probably this building, which was the Vineyard Post Office, where the D's detachment <coughs> disbanded on January 7, 1839. Uh, this building is now at Prairie Grove uh, Battlefield. But uh, Couts was there for about four months. And, um, and unlike his superiors, uh, including the, the President of the United States, he disagreed with the assessment by uh, General Arbuckle uh, and James McKissick, who took depositions from the, the uh, witnesses to these attacks uh, in Going Snake. But uh, one of the things that uh, uh, George Lowry did was he appointed a committee to investigate the, the recent uh, disturbances. And the members of this committee were George Hicks, Stephen Foreman, John Thorne, and William Shorty Cootie. And they filed their report on November 25th, uh, 1845, and it uh, disagreed uh, with virtually everything that the military had concluded about the, the nature and the cause of the disturbances. Because General Arbuckle Buck had argued that all of this internal violence had been brought up by uh, actions taken by the National Council to the detriment of the uh, minority parties. 
James K. Polk, who was then President of the United States, sent a message to Congress by way of a Senate document on April the 13th, 1846. He included in that document the depositions that had been taken by McKissick and others uh, from uh, the Treaty Party members. And Polk uh, also demanded that the murderers, i.e. Dakwa and the 16 people in his uh, group, be arrested and tried for murder. And uh, Polk also asked Congress to enact legislation to extend U.S. laws so that the murderers could be tried in U.S. court instead of tribal court uh, in the Cherokee Nation. Now, the big question is why did Lieutenant K. Johnson Cowles, who was the second lieutenant in the first Dragoons, take a position that was so contrary to the people he reported to? According to his great-granddaughter, Counts at this time was in love with John Ross's niece and had spent time uh, in Tahlequah socializing at places including uh, the Murrow home. And I put this slide in this morning because Shirley handed me a document uh, indicating the Counts was there and, uh, and made some statements about some of the people he met. He said that, uh, uh, he said that Mr. Murrow's that this is after a wedding. We had a truly delightful time, played until two o'clock. Mr. Ross, DS, and myself got pretty well whipped. Also, that's uh, Hicks. He described uh, Miss Mary Ross as an attractive, beautiful, highly accomplished young lady. And he also said Miss Hicks is most beautiful and one of the most perfect beauties I ever saw. So, uh, obviously, he had some connections to the Ross party that don't show up in the congressional records. Um, but shortly after this, uh, Mary Jane Ross married William Potter Ross, who wrote the letter. And in William, or in K. Johnson Count's diary, which he later wrote, uh, he, he starts it out by writing to some lost love in Tennessee, and he said, that before he left the Cherokee Nation, because uh, right after this, the Mexican War broke out, he was sent to Mexico. He said, like you, I never realized how much I loved her until after she was married. So he may have been talking about the wife of William Potter Ross. <coughs> but uh, seven days after the con congressional report went to Congress uh, from the president uh, demanding that the people involved in these disturbances be arrested and tried for murder. Uh, William Potter Ross wrote the letter which uh, we described earlier to K. Johnson Counts and presented this bandolier bag from Dakwa. Uh, now, we're not sure, uh, and, and in the letter William Potter Ross talks about the correct and uh, manly uh, statements public statements he made about the recent disturbances. We're not sure what those were, but looking at the history around this time, 10 days after uh, he received the letter in the Vandalier Bay and the Going Snake District, a Wheeler Fout was hanged uh, by uh, Sheriff Benjamin Van uh, for the murder of Degadoga. And before his execution, he implicated a number of people, including members of the Starr family, uh, Tom, Ellis, Jim, Sam, William, Washington Starr, John Ryder, James Taylor, and a white man named Madison Gearing uh, in the murder. But as far as, as far as I know, they were never tried, because in August of 1846, the, the treaty which brought, finally brought together the three factions of the Cherokee Nation was signed in Washington, D.C. John Ross was there, Stan Wadey was there, and the second article of the treaty says it grants general amnesty to everyone who was involved in post-removal violence uh, in the Cherokee Nation. So the, the record, in effect, was wiped clean. There was no longer any way to bring charges against anyone, and apparently both sides 
were, were agreeable to this provision in the treaty. But Stan Wadey did remark afterwards that his side, the treaty party, had much more to forgive than the Ross party did. But perhaps in part because Cade Johnson counts defined his superior officers, he was quickly sent off to another theater of operation, the war in Mexico. But he took with him the bandolier bag, the letter, the plug of tobacco, possibly the pipe. The pipe hasn't survived to the present. But he was sent to Monterey, New Mexico, saw action there, was uh, when the military action in Mexico tapered off, he was sent to California where things were still happening. He kept a diary, uh, went up here, was first stationed at Los Angeles, and then sent to San Diego right at the end of the war. In San Diego, uh, a teenager, Isadora Bandini, who was the daughter of a Mexican government official in San Diego, Juan Bandini, this is him and this is his daughter, uh, knew that the troops were coming, that the U.S. troops were coming to San Diego, and she and her sisters realized that there were no American flags to welcome mm -hmm. the U.S. troops coming into the city. So she and her sisters made an American flag out of their, out of their petticoats and stood on the balcony watching the parade of U.S. troops come into San Diego. And as she was leaning over the balcony, waving the flag, she tumbled over the rail and landed in the arms of Lieutenant K. Johnson Counts. <laughs> Uh, she declared that he had saved her life, and of course they had to get married. And they <laughs> uh, as a wedding present, her father gave them Rancho Wahomey, uh, which is still around today. But as a result of this large rancho, uh, 12 miles north of San Diego, uh, California, uh, Kate Johnson Counts became one of the wealthiest men in California. And this is him in uh, later life. But he died fairly young. Uh, he died in uh, 1874. He was uh, 53 years old. Uh, but he left behind a large family, a large estate, and a bandolier bag of times long ago in the Cherokee Nation. Thank you.